Welcome to the Christian Ministry Church Podcast. We're praying that this message equips and empowers you to live in the kingdom of God. Now for today's sermon by Pastor Tim Brooks. I'll hold that clapping just for a second. It's, it's pretty easy to clap for these folks that are on stage making worship possible for us. But I just continue to want to remind you, we got folks sitting down in a hole down here in the concrete making this possible, folks in the back making this possible. This building is four stories tall. We got people up on the second floor back in the back running a bunch of the stuff making this possible. We got folks taking care of the nursery making this possible. There's a lot of people that made that experience possible for you to enter into the presence of the Lord. Okay, come on now. Thank y'all. Thank you, thank you for helping. Thank you for making that possible for me just to walk in here and have a worship experience. There's a lot of folks that got here really early to make that happen for all of us, and we continue to be grateful. Well, just a few weeks ago, I just kind of half-cocked threw out an announcement about the fact that Connie Holmes was going to be hosting a trip to Dallas to tour the museum that David Barton and Tim Barton Uh, talk about every time that they're here. They refer to this museum. They refer to all of these um, just countless hundreds of thousands of documents, handwritten documents from George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, our founding fathers talking about the Christian foundation of this nation. And everybody, oh, I wish I could see that. I wish I could see that. Well, we're putting together a tour to go down and, and be able to see some of this, hold some of these things in your hand and you see the Christian foundation of this country, and it's 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 pretty awesome experience. Well, I just sort of half cocked through that announcement out because it's too early to talk about it, and just like that, the 60 spots really got taken real quick. Uh, we've only got some, I don't know, some 20 left. I don't even know how many we're down to, but I want to remind you now it's getting closer to time on your way out. It'll be a great weekend now. It's just an all-day Saturday down here at this museum. Tim Barton's going to be teaching two sessions. He's going to be leading the tour. It'll be a chance of a lifetime. And if you're interested in taking that tour, y'all stop out there and talk to Sean and Connie on your way out. But there's just a few spots left and we need to get those uh, finished up and get you ready to go. It's, It's a chance of a lifetime. Well, turn to Exodus chapter 18, verse 20. We read in Exodus about God's kids being enslaved. Pharaoh had them in his control. They couldn't do anything about it. God called Moses. Moses agreed to allow God to use him. And God supernaturally delivered these these folks. Supernatural. There wasn't anything they could do. They were held captive and there was nothing they could do for their salvation. And God just delivered them. Well, as soon as they are out of Egypt, as soon as they are set free, then God begins to teach them their part. Now, here is your part in this. There was a certain conduct that God required. I want everybody in here to have Exodus chapter 18, verse 20 underlined in your Bible. Moses was to teach them God's laws, and it says, show them how to conduct their lives. Show them how to conduct their lives. The title of today's sermon is Our Conduct. Our Conduct. God told Moses, show them how to conduct their lives. The way we walk, the way we talk, the way we work, uh, the way we live, our conduct. It's our behavior. It's the way we live. It's important to God. We see very clear God's people How they acted, how they behaved, how they conducted themselves was very important to God. Very important to God. Obviously, it was important to God since he told Moses to teach them right conduct. There is a right behavior and there is a wrong behavior. And it, since the beginning of time, has never been left up to the individual to choose right and wrong for themselves. Moses, you teach them right conduct. God has a right and wrong conduct. Now, I want you to think about this with me. Let's think about this. 
why in this world would God care? Now, I want you to think about it. Young people, I want you to think this through. God holds the universe in the palm of his hand. God always has been. God always will be. Why in this world would God give a flip about what you do, about how you act? What is it to God what you suck up your nose? What, is, what would he possibly care? What would God care what bathroom you decided you identified with? How, how you respond to others? Why would God Give a flip about that. I want you to think this through. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, God changeth not. God doesn't change. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't change. How you act does nothing to affect God. Why? Come on, I'm asking you to think about this. Why does God care what you do? What is it to God if you murder somebody? I mean, thousands of people are being born every day. That person's going to die anyway. You just did them a favor. What, what, what is it to God if you sleep with somebody you're not married to? What could he possibly care about that? What is it to God if you steal something? That person can just buy, some, buy something else. Fact is, they probably got insurance and they can just get a new one. I did them a favor. I stole that. Well, what is it to God if you get drunk? I mean, you're just trying to enjoy life, just trying to relax a little, just unwind. What possibly could God care if you do that? I mean, what what possibly could God care if you have same-sex attraction? What did God care if you have opposite-sex attraction? What what did God care if you're attracted to kids? What does God care if you're attracted to an animal? I mean, what what does he care? What, What difference... Now, we're thinking, what difference would it make to God if you tell everybody you're a girl when really you're a boy? Science says that. Biology says that. Everything in life says that. But clearly, you decide to tell everybody you're this. There's only one possible answer to this. Why would God care? It didn't change God. What? There's only one possible answer. It's not for God. It's for you and I. It's for you. It is all the only reason, the only answer that we can come up with is our right conduct is for us. Is for us. It's not to ruin your life. Right conduct will bless your life. Exodus chapter 18. Moses teach them how to conduct their lives because wrong conduct will hurt them. Wrong conduct will end up destroying them. Right after chapter 18 of Exodus, where Moses is to teach right conduct, we read Exodus chapter 20, God giving the Ten Commandments. No other gods before me, no idols, do not misuse the name of the Lord, keep the Sabbath day holy, honor your father and mother, Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not covet. All this is God teaching us right conduct. And church, these aren't for God. They're for us. They're for you. You don't have this item. You don't have the money to buy it. That person's got it. I'm going to steal it. That'll make me happy. It it won't make you happy. For the rest of your life, you'll worry about getting caught. For the rest of your life, you'll be looking over your shoulder wondering if somebody found out. For every time you look at that, you got to deal with the fact is, I didn't pay for that. I stole that. And if they find out, then I'm going to... See, that won't do for you what you think it's going to do for you. It won't do. It won't do for you. Just an adulterous fair, boy, that'd be fun. It it won't work for you. It It won't work for you. You live in a panic the rest of your life. Every time your phone rings, you got to grab it before your wife does. I mean, it's a wonderful life for me to be driving down the road and my phone gets a text and I just tell Terry, read that to me. 
See, but if you, if it, here's what, don't do it. It looks fun. Looks like it'll make you happy. It'll ruin your whole life. See, it's for you. It's not for God. Why did God say do not? And we act like we're doing God a favor. We act like God is trying to keep life from us. Don't because it won't do for you what you think it will. See, this conduct that God teaches us, there's a conduct that will make you blessed, keep you in peace, to make your life fulfilled. I'm a very unhappy, depressed teenager. I know, I'll just tell everybody I'm a girl when really I'm a boy. That'll make me happy. I'm a very unhappy, depressed teenager. I'll tell everybody I'm a cat. I'll hang a tail out of my jeans and hiss and meow. That'll make me happy. Church, unhappy people are unhappy on the inside because there's a longing to have a right relationship with God. And when you're unhappy on the inside, you can hang all the tails out of your jeans you want to. When you're unhappy on the inside, you can put on a dress if you're a boy or you can put, see if when you're unhappy on the inside, you try to make yourself happy by doing things on the outside and God says, don't do it. Thou shalt not. He's mean. He's just mean. No, he's trying to show you how to have happiness. The reason, the reason this church is talking about the God kind of life. The reason we're talking about our conduct, the reason week in and week out and week in and week out, the reason we're just preaching this and preaching this and preaching this is because we gotta stand up against a woke culture that's cramming it down our throat, cramming it down our throat and tell you there is a right conduct that'll lead to life and peace. This woke culture And all it's approving and all it's accepting will destroy lives. It always has and it always will. That's why God says all the way from Exodus, teach right conduct because God is for you. God is for you. Young people, God is for you. His ways, his laws, his requirements, they're for your blessing. He's not trying to keep you from having any fun. We teach, we stand up for right conduct, regardless if it's currently popular or not, because it is what you're looking for. Paganism, a godless life is paganism. And it is always the pull of the sin nature. Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 8 talks all about this. There is a sin nature that is constantly against God. Always has been against God, always will be against God. And we have a sin nature that is pulling us away from God. In Exodus, we read Moses went up to the mountain to be with God. He wasn't up there but just days. It's amazing how quick we can blow it. The people wanted to have other gods. They wanted to worship other things. They wanted to go out and live a little. They wanted to be like the other nations. We want to do like the other people. It it didn't take them any time. They start getting their gold. Same would be money today. And let's put this together and make us an idol. And let's replace God in our lives. Chapter 32, verse 4. These are the gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. What? Why are you kidding me? See, this is what will make you happy. We're seeing it every day in our life. This is what will make you happy. This is what will bring you joy. This is what will deliver you from bondage. You got to be kidding me. We melted down some gold and made a calf. And then we're telling everybody this. uh, Everyone there saw the powerful hand of God. Everybody there saw one miracle after the next. They saw the sea part. They saw God feed them. They saw God provide water. How quick we look to other things to meet our needs. How quick? As soon as the people turned from God, they started worshiping other things. Exodus chapter 32, verse 6. They celebrated feasting, drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. 
They indulged in a godlessness fun. That's what they were doing in pagan revelry. God told Moses, verse seven, quick, they corrupted themselves. See, they didn't do anything against God. They corrupted themselves. We're hurting ourselves. We're allowing our kids to corrupt themselves. Come on, we got to make a stand. We got to make a stand. Verse eight, how quickly they've turned from the way I commanded them. God has always had a do this list and a don't do that list. God has always had a lifestyle. God has always had a conduct. The natural born human sin nature always wants to pull toward paganism, always has. And it's exactly what we see in Exodus is exactly what we see today. Kids growing up in godly homes, great parents, taught the God kind of life. Kids saw God do miracles in their family. They heard about their parents and their parents' testimony. Kids, they knew God. They saw God firsthand. Days out of the home, idols to replace God. Verse 6, engage in pagan revelry. Verse 7, corrupting themselves. Verse 8, how quickly they turned from the way God commanded them to live. Church, this is not a new thing we're dealing with today. Turning from God into paganism, it's not a new thing. It's been going on since the beginning of time. A pull by the sin nature to pull us away from God. It's the path the sin nature wants to go. Well, Tim, I was born with these desires. No doubt about it. Every person alive is born with desires that will destroy you. No one teaches a child to bite. No five-year-old brother sits down with their two-year-old and says, now look, anytime you get a chance, grab another kid by the arm and take a chunk out of it. Let me show you how to do this. No, you're born with desires to do wrong. You're born, nobody said, okay, now listen, when you don't get your way, slam yourself into the floor, slamming the back of your head against the floor, kicking your feet, screaming to the top of your lungs, flouncing around like a fish that's been thrown up on the bank. Let me show you how to do this. Where do you learn to do that? We're born with a sin nature. No one teaches you to lie. No one teaches you to grab a toy from another kid. That's why God says, don't do it. Because there are drives and urges that we've all been born with that take us in the wrong direction. I understand every desire that you have. I understand every born desire that you have. God understands those desires. That's why he said, don't live that way. Don't live that way. I've got a kind of life that'll bring you peace and joy. That's not the way you want to do. The pagan life will not produce what you're looking for. The only reason God says don't, and I wish we could get this. The only reason God says don't is it won't work. That's it. It won't work for you. It won't work for your mate. It won't work for your kids. It won't work for those who are around you. And it's vital that we see God's laws fix problems before they happen. That's what God's laws do. They fix problems before they happen. God created us. He knows what will produce life, peace, joy, satisfaction, fulfillment. He knows what over time will eat your life up until it destroys you. Aren't you glad we got God's word and we don't have to learn for ourselves? Aren't you glad we got his laws? They protect us. They keep us safe. They keep us in a place where we can be blessed. Church, this is ridiculous. It is a crime to tell a confused 13-year-old that's just trying to figure life out, that's going through all kind of hormonal changes, to tell them that reassignment surgery is a good thing and it's okay. That's a crime. That's a crime to tell our young people that. We ought to tell them you'll have physical and mental problems for the rest of your life if you do that. And for the rest of your life, you will have pain in your body from now on. That's not what you want to do. It's a crime to say that's a good idea. 
What we are to do is teach right conduct that will produce a good life for them. We're teaching right conduct. We say to a 13-year-old, Tim, what are we supposed to do? How do we handle this? We say to a confused 13-year-old, honey, when you were one year old, you started biting all of your brothers and sisters and your friends in the nursery. I had to teach you, no, that's not right conduct. When you were two years old, whatever toy another kid was playing with in the nursery at church, you'd rip it out of their hands. I had to teach you, no, that's not right conduct. When you were 10 years old, had to go down to the school, you were fighting on the playground. You and I had to have a talk. I had to teach you, this is not right conduct. Now, you're 13. You're saying you're a girl when clearly you're a boy. Right now, I've got to teach you. That's right, wrong conduct. That's, that's the wrong conduct. See, we teach our 13-year-olds, as a matter of fact, all your life. This drive never ends. There is a sin nature that urges within us, and we all deal with this. And we deal with it for our whole life. Let me tell you something else. When you're married and you've got some kids, you're going to have a desire for somebody else. I desire to live somewhere else. I desire to be married to somebody else. As a matter of fact, you may have a desire for somebody else that you work with. Let me tell you, after you're married and you've got kids, you may decide, I've got desires for same-sex attraction. You say no to your sin nature all the way through life. It's a lesson in living life that we have to learn to be obedient to God and not be obedient to that sin nature. And I taught you that at one, I'm teaching you that at 13, and I got to tell you, when you're 50, you're still gonna have to say no to a wrong thought. You're gonna have to say no to that. Every age, you have to say no to wrong conduct. We teach right conduct. We teach how to conduct yourself. Mom says, don't touch that electrical outlet. Don't touch that electrical outlet. What difference does it make to her? Here, put both fingers in it. I mean, it, she's not going to get a jolt out of it. What difference could it possibly make to your mother if you touch that electrical outlet? She's trying to fix the problem before it happens. She knows the end result of what's going to happen when you put your finger in there. See, there are some that just trust mom's law. But most think mom's trying to keep fun from them. And so as soon as she turns around, some of you were that kid. Mom says, don't touch that stove. What, what could it possibly make her any difference at all? I think your mom's just trying to keep you from having fun. I think your mom's trying to keep you from having any fun. Get out and live a little. Put both hands on your stove. What kind of mom would say to a two-year-old, I'm going to set you up here on this countertop. That red glow is on that stove. You choose right and wrong for yourself. In this day and time, everybody choose. Who am I to say no? Who am I to put my laws on you? Just choose right and wrong for yourself. What kind of mom would do that? Come on, are you getting this today? What difference would it make to her if you put both hands on the stove? She is trying to keep you from an outcome that you don't want. It looks pretty. It looks fun. It looks luring. I want to choose right and wrong for myself. That pretty glow, I got to touch it. Not what you want to do. Mom says, don't touch that. Why? Because it does look pretty. It does look fun. It is luring, and she knows the effect that that's going to have in your life. Today, church, I'm just asking us to spend a minute here just logically, rationally, thinking through where we are in this day and time. God's conduct on living. His conduct on stealing, on lying, on cheating, on marriage, on sexual immorality, all of these are to prevent 
problems in your life for you and for us as a society. Parents, children's church workers, youth workers, pastors, friends, uncles, aunts, let's teach the God kind of life. Let's teach the God kind of life. This society is not backing me off. I'm not backed off because I know what will happen if you put your hand on that stove. I'm not backing off. I'm going to teach right conduct. See, we say no to a two-year-old. Don't touch that stove. A 13-year-old that wants to say they're a boy when they're a girl. We say no, 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 no. To a 30-year-old that wants to steal. We say no, 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 no. To a 40-year-old that wants to leave and run out on their family. No, 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 no. See, there's a right conduct and there's a wrong conduct. And we all through our life have to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Why do we have to do that? Because you're going to have a lot of thoughts that are against God. You're going to have a lot of thoughts that are not in obedience to Christ. And all day long... I battle my thinking because I'm pretty good at having thoughts that I shouldn't have. They just come to me quite often. I can't think that. I can't act on that. I can't say that because there is a right conduct. There is a right conduct that leads to life and life more abundant. The way God says to live is just not outdated. If someone has a hot temper and beats somebody up, They're just born with urges to be mean and to hit somebody. They're just born with an urge. They just like to fight. We're not going to accept that. We're not going to tolerate that. And we're not going to identify that as an alternative lifestyle. If someone steals, they're born with an urge to take somebody's stuff. We're not going to accept that as an alternative lifestyle. We're not going to. To allow that to go on. We're not going to tell everybody that's a, he steals. Come on, be open-minded. Let's accept each other as an individual. Let's let everybody choose right and wrong for themselves. He stole that. Come on, don't be a bigot. Come on, don't be a bigot. Let's have an open mind about this. Church, there is a wrong conduct. There is a wrong conduct. I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm not saying that I'm always doing right. I'm just saying we're always trying to teach right. We're always holding up a standard of right. No, 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 no. You're not choosing what bathroom you go into. No, I'm going to tell you that. You're not going to do that. You're not going in to the girls' bathroom when my granddaughter is in there. You ain't going in there. That's wrong. See, no, you're not a man entering a woman's sporting event. See, there are events for women. There are events for men. And you compete in the appropriate one. That's what we're going to do here. You're not going to enter into that one. See, we're being told one man, one woman for marriage. That's outdated. Okay, who's going to pay for the kids? Who's going to pay for the kids of a society with just free sex and love? Who's out working in this heat to pay for those tennis shoes, those braces, Oh, you got a ball tournament this weekend? Here, let me pay for your tournament fees and let me provide a hotel for you to stay in out of town. See, who's working to provide that for kids? Well, kids living like animals because they don't have a mom and a dad. Paul and I have been to Honduras, been right there. I'm not talking about street kids. I'm talking about street kids. We're talking about the product of no mom, no dad, just everybody doing what's right in their own eyes. Little children, little children living under buildings. We watch them by the hundreds eating out of the dumpsters. We watch them and they die. Alvin does funerals for 12 and 13 year olds all the time that starve to death, that got disease. And so, why? All because of God's conduct. Wooden camp. All because of a society that had a better idea than God about children and about families and how to do this. Today, for our young people, I'm just trying to get us to think right about the conduct that God requires. It's not something you rebel against. 
The conduct that God requires is not something that you want to rebel against, push away from, I'm going to go and live life and do my own thing. I'm trying to get our young people today to fall in love with God's laws. Fall in love with God's laws. I'm shocked by the destruction of the Ten Commandments in our society. I drive by our Ten Commandments that are out on the highway, and every day I drive by them, I hope everybody up and down this road is going to be obedient to those. Everywhere I go, I hope they got, don't steal, don't lie. Every time my wife takes off and drives her car into town, I'm hoping those Ten Commandments are in effect for every person that she's going to come in contact throughout her trip to town and back. I love the Ten Commandments. I love them because they keep me safe and they protect me where I go. I want our young people to have a love for God's law, to see it as a positive in their life. It's not something that you want to shove away and rebel against. It is a requirement to bless you, to keep you safe. It's a requirement that God has put on all of us so that we can live in peace. Mark your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we start reading in verse 9. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourself. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes, or practice homosexuality, or are thieves, or greedy people, or drunkards, or abusive, or cheat. People, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11, some of you were once like that. Many of you say, amen, I've been right there. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God. By calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself. Church, you won't leave God's conduct and have life work for you. It won't happen. That's the reason we're all about teaching right conduct. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. Let the Holy Spirit guide your life. Not this culture. Not friends on TikTok, not the Hallmark Channel who is insistent on putting gay marriages in our living rooms every day, every day. Let the Holy Spirit guide your life. Not Disney who is consumed with making transgender a normal thing. Here's what I want you to know. Galatians chapter 5, let the Holy Spirit guide your life. Verse 17, the sinful nature wants to do evil which is just opposite of what the Holy Spirit wants to do. I get it. You and I, you're born with a sinful nature, and it wants to do evil. Sin is the something in us that makes us want to touch that stove. We want to stick our finger in that electrical outlet. Everybody turn to Psalms chapter 19. We're born with a sinful nature. It wants to do wrong. It's wanted to do wrong your whole life. When you came home from the hospital and you were one day old, you were consumed with selfishness. All you thought was selfish thoughts. At two years old, you bit, you threw a fit, you took away toys from the other children. At 10 years old, you'd fight on the playground. You had to be taught a right conduct. Son, this is wrong and it's unacceptable and we're not going to tolerate it. 13-year-old hang the tail out of your pants and meow, honey, that's wrong. It's unacceptable, and we're not going to tolerate it. We're not going to tolerate it at home, and we're not going to tolerate it at the school. 17-year-old, you think you're a boy when you're clearly a girl. That's wrong. This is wrong conduct. We're not going to accept it. We're not going to tolerate it. 30-year-old, you decide to do this and run off. Whoa, whoa, what? That's not, that's not what you want to do. 50-year-old, you let your temper get away from you and you beat somebody to a pulp. It's wrong conduct. Fact is, we're going to put you in jail until you can control yourself. Church, wrong conduct is after all of us, all of our life. Let's be careful in our minds that we're handling this correctly. 
Oh, I can't believe that person. What do you mean you can't believe that person? You got sin lurking in you as well. Wrong conduct is after all of us all the time. That's why we teach right conduct. That's why we teach right conduct. Psalms chapter 19. I want all of us to read together verse 7. The, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Verse 8, the commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, it's lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the honeycomb. They are a warning to your servant and a great reward for those who obey them. How can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me from these hidden faults. Keep your servant from deliberate sins. Don't let them control me. Then I'll be free of guilt and innocent of great sin. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Oh, stand with me. Everybody just bow your head. Repeat after me. God, your instructions are perfect. Your laws are trustworthy. Your commands are right. They bring joy to my heart. Your commands are very clear. Your laws are true. There is sin lurking in my heart. Cleanse me today from these hidden faults. Don't let sin control me. Lord, I desire your laws of conduct more than gold. Your laws of conduct are sweeter than honey. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be pleasing to you. You are my rock and you are my redeemer. Amen and amen. Father, today we give you thanks for your word. It's desirable. It's not something for us to rebel against. It's something for us to love and be drawn to. Help us. Help us with the sin that lurks within our hearts as we navigate this life and conduct ourselves in a way pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Thank you for listening to this message from Christian Ministries Church. If this message impacted you and you'd like to sow into our ministry, you can give at cmchurch.com. If you'd like to listen to more of our messages, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Just search for Christian Ministries. God bless.